Good afternoon and welcome to Finley Davies webinar, Pension Plan De-Risking and Terminated Vested Buyouts, Why Now? For those of you who would like to take notes on the slides, uh, you should have received a confirmation email yesterday with a link to the slides on our website. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the chat area on the right side of your screen. If that didn't immediately come up, if you go to the top of your screen, you should get a, a drop-down menu and press the chat button, and then a, the chat box will appear. My name is Matt Klein. I'm one of the presenters today. I'm a managing consultant and author of Finley Davies Pension Indicator. I'm an enrolled actuary and a fellow of the Society of Actuaries, working with clients on de-risking strategies, forecasting, consulting, and plan terminations. Mark Onstead will be presenting second. He is a principal and leads the firm's defined benefit administration practice. As an associate of the Society of Actuaries and a member of the American Academy of Actuaries, Mark helps clients reduce costs by leveraging technology and our firm's call center for pension plan administration needs. So with our half hour time period, we're going to jump right into this. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat uh, at any point during the presentation. So today's topic is on, on de-risking. Um, so we're going to start off talking at a very high level about a few different ways of, of de-risking. Uh, but before we even start on that, we, let's talk about what are we trying to de-risk. And uh, we could probably come up with a whole slide of, of you know, different risks, but it really boils down to there's really four big risks that uh, have the biggest impact for plan sponsors, and that is the uh, investment, interest rate, inflation, and mortality risks. Of course, everyone is uh, very much aware of the investment risk, uh, as everyone still has 2008 uh, fresh in our minds. The interest rate risk, of course, is uh, very uh, is also very much on plan sponsors' minds, with the uh, with the historically low interest rate environment that we've had for several years now. Uh, we've had very high. Uh, funding requirements and very high uh, liabilities that we've had to report on on balance sheets. And then uh, the, the last one, the mortality, we'll uh, be talking about more in a few slides, uh, but that's also uh, a risk that sometimes we don't fully appreciate, uh, but one that's going to uh, be making itself more known here over the next couple of years. Uh, so those are our big risks, and then we need to figure out, you know, what our risk tolerance is. Of course, this will vary from a plan sponsor to plan sponsor, but we need to figure out, you know, what risks are acceptable, uh, which ones we want to try to minimize or mitigate. And normally how we do that is, is looking through the lens of, you know, what the plan sponsor, what's most important to the plan sponsor. Are they worried about? Uh, from a funding perspective for cash flow purposes, or do they focus more on the balance sheet and the accounting side of things? And so, you know, you, know, you can come up certainly with different answers based on which lens uh, you want to use. So, let's talk for a brief second about, you know, the plan design itself. Um, you know, you know, there's a lot of talk about the, the you know traditional DV plan and uh, and you know how difficult it can be for plan sponsors. So we wanted to just you know introduce the concept that there are some innovative plan designs uh, that are available out there. Uh, while they haven't, uh, I don't think anyone would argue they've caught fire yet. They are starting to uh, pick up some interest and. One of the most interesting ones, I think, is this concept of a variable annuity plan, uh, which works kind of like a 401k plan. Um, the, the idea here is to kind of marry, you know, the best aspects of DB, but also bring in some of the best aspects of a defined contribution arrangement. So, you know, the big plus uh, for, for a DB plan is that it provides the lifetime income. 
which is probably the biggest criticism of defined contribution plans is we're just giving people a big pot of money at the end and expecting them to try to manage that for uh, the rest of their life. Uh, but it also, the a variable annuity plan, the investment risk is borne by the participants, uh, which of course is the biggest risk uh, in a DV plan. And I think, you know, the world has grown accustomed to 401k plans and the fact that uh, account balances can go down. And I think there's more of an openness to, you know, looking at uh, a DV plan that would, you know, where the accrued benefit could go down. Uh, if the underlying investments didn't do well, well, that would have been, you know, earth shattering. I think you know, participants are more open to that concept as they become uh, used to 401ks. The mortality risk in a variable annuity plan is still borne by the employer, but that's, uh, again, that's a very, uh, uh, very nice uh, function of of the DB plans. Um, the way the variable annuity plan works is there is, uh, an, you have an accrued benefit much like a DB plan, but uh, that, like I said, that accrued benefit can go up and down each year based on, uh, based on the underlying performance of the plan assets. So uh, it really creates a nice uh, a nice balancing and not, a much better sharing of the risk pool uh, between the employer and the employee. So when you're talking about de-risking, you know, we need to start, you need to know what your plan looks like and, and just as an example here, I think this is, you know, probably what the quote typical plan might look like right now. Uh, where you've got roughly a quarter of your liability with uh, active participants, a quarter of your liability with um, terminated vested participants, and maybe half of your liability uh, in a with retirees. So, you know, as we talk about these different solutions, you know, knowing you know what how your specific plan is uh, made up of, and really will show what kind of uh, the swings you have. Uh, you know, if you have a, as we talk further about a terminated vested buyouts, uh, you know, if your terminated vested population is, you know, much bigger uh, than the 27% we're showing here, you know, potentially have a much bigger impact uh, to your, you know, your balance sheets and your, your funding equation. Uh, but first, let's talk about annuity purchases. These gained a lot of attention in 2012 with the GM and then also the Verizon uh, decisions. Um, with an annuity purchase where you're basically moving the retirees off on, on into an insurance company, and in general, you know, there's a significant premium that you're going to have to pay, uh, certainly when you're comparing that to uh, a funding target rate that might be including uh, that, that is including MAP 21 rates that uh, have a lot of smoothing involved. So you know, the analogy I like to make is you're kind of moving from self-insurance to uh, a fully insured uh, product uh, to do an annuity purchase, and so there's a premium that, that has to be paid uh, to the insurance company to take all that risk. Um, so we've seen a lot of interest in annuity purchases um, but we haven't seen a, a whole lot of action uh, as far as moving towards, you know, going through with those. The interest rate environment right now still tends to be pretty low that most plan sponsors uh, are not willing to pull the trigger. But it will be interesting to see, you know, we've been waiting for interest rates to rise for some time, but when they actually do rise, you know, whether that's in 15 or 16 or further down the line, you know, if annuity purchases, you know, we, we expect will become much more popular. So the, you know, the biggest de-risking that we're seeing here in 2014 is a terminated vested buyout. Uh, so let's talk for a brief second about what exactly that means. It's when the pension plan is allowed, is amended, to allow you know, terminated vested participants, again, these are participants that are no longer active for you, uh, 
uh, but also having started their uh, their monthly benefit yet. We're going to give them a chance, open up a 45 to 60 day window where we will where we will offer them a one time lump sum in exchange uh, instead of getting their annuity at 65. The assumptions that are used to determine that lump sum are controlled by the IRS and uh, Code Section 417. But the way the lump sums are being calculated right now, we're expecting these to be very popular here in the second half of 2014, uh, especially as interest rates uh, have stayed down, have, have fallen during 2014. Terminated vested buyouts are not a brand new concept. Uh, they, you know, they've been available for plan sponsors to pull the trigger for for many years. Uh, we saw them; they certainly were popular in 2012, and we expect them to, them to be popular again here in 2014. So we're going to talk about a little bit about the pros and the cons to uh, such an arrangement. The traditional pros to doing a buyout is, you know simply the, the volatility reduction. You know, you're going to remove a, uh, a certain percentage of your plan's assets and liabilities off of the balance sheet or, you know, remove them from the funding equation. And so you're just lowering the risk profile of the pension plan, uh, which in and of itself is, is enough reason for, for many plan sponsors uh, who have a significant pension plan uh, investment. Uh, and now, again, we're no longer self-insuring that, that investment. We've, we've moved that risk uh, off to uh, the employees, uh, or the former employees in this case, to, to let them manage uh, the assets. But what we've seen over the last couple of years now, and specifically here in 2014, you know, some additional reasons for why plan sponsors are going to be are, are looking at this so much, and that is uh, the increased PBGC premiums, which we'll talk about momentarily, uh, improved life expectancies, which increase the value of those lump sums, and then the fact that now that PPA is fully implemented, we're calculating the lump sums on a corporate bond basis as opposed to uh, the 30-year treasury that we're using uh, prior to PPA and using a blend uh, as we were phasing in the uh, Pension Protection Act. So the PBGC premium that every plan sponsor pays, uh, it consists of, uh, there's two prongs to that premium. The first one is a, a, a variable rate premium that plan sponsors pay a percentage based on how underfunded their plan is. Obviously, the more underfunded, the higher the premium is. And uh, for for 20 plus years, that that percentage was fixed. Uh, we've had twice now in the last couple of years where congressional action has caused uh, increases in that percentage. And what we see in 2015 is a significant increase from over 2014 in the amount of premium that a plan sponsor is going to have to pay. On the other side, the, there's the PBGC flat rate premium, which is simply a premium based on the number of participants of your plan. As we can see from this chart as well, uh, this was increasing with inflation for many years, but again, uh, a couple times uh, Congress has uh, significantly increased this P, the per participant fee uh, is going up significantly over the next few years. So. You know, as we're telling our plan sponsors for 2015, they could easily be looking at a 50% increase in what they're paying to the PBGC. So this is causing a lot of plan sponsors to figure out, you know, ways to try to mitigate that kind of cost increase. The other aspect that we're looking at is the improving uh, life expectancies of, uh, of participants and the population in general. Uh, of course, 
you know, most people think improving life expectancies are good, and that is a good thing, but for pension plan purposes, that means people are living longer and we're having to pay out benefits for a longer period of time. And there is a new mortality table that's expected to be finalized later this year. It's going to be the, the RP 2014 table, uh, which is going to replace the uh, RP 2000 table. And what we have seen as we've, uh, people have, uh, act, other actuaries have done their analysis and we've looked at uh, life expectancies as, uh, you know, we didn't a anticipate uh, the increase in, in, especially in female life expectancy uh, as much as uh, what has occurred in reality. So at, at what point we, you know, when we move to update the mortality table and we expect the IRS to, you know, implement this RP 2014 table probably in 2016. Um, it will, we will see a significant increase in the, uh, in the cost of lump sums, uh, especially for females, but as you can see from the chart here, uh, lump sums for males will, will also be increasing uh, just simply as a, as a fact that uh, the people are living longer. So those are kind of the reasons why we're seeing it right now. Uh, let's talk about the cons for a minute. And, you know, generally the biggest con is, you know, the, there generally is a premium to be paid for offering lump sums, uh, especially when we're comparing this uh, to your, your funding target or a cash flow basis. With the MAP21 rates, you're probably looking at an effective rate, you know, in 2014 of something around five and three quarters. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're paying out, what we've shown here is a 40, 50, and 60-year-old, roughly what the effective rate would be to, to cash them out in a uh, terminated vested buyout. So uh, for, for older people, uh, older uh, members of the population, the, you're going to be paying out more in that lump sum than you're necessarily reflecting for, on your, for your funding target. From an accounting perspective, we're seeing it's not quite as dramatic because uh, for balance sheet purposes, we're using more of an, e an immediate rate. And at the end of 2013, we we're seeing a lot of plans at a four and three quarters to five and a quarter type discount rate. So, you know, that's a much more equitable dollar for dollar type uh, transaction. But you need to, we need to be, you know, very careful when we do these that if we open up the floodgates to everyone, we need to, you know, pay attention to, you know, any uh, special balance sheet. Uh, if enough people accept a terminated vested lump sum, it very likely will trigger a one-time uh, settlement accounting uh, to the, the P&L in the year in which the uh, lump sum offering is held. Uh, with the large amount of unrecognized losses um, sitting out on most uh, plan sponsors' balance sheets, that will result in a potentially a significant uh, hit to the P&L uh, in the year it's implemented. Uh, with the, from a funding perspective, because we are paying out uh, more than we're releasing in liability, it will lower our funded percentages. And so, uh, if you uh, are familiar, if you, know, as you should know from your pension plan, uh, everyone's you know very wary of making sure that they try to stay above that 80% threshold to avoid having any sort of uh, benefit restrictions issues. So you know we want to make sure you know, that we do an analysis to make sure there's not going to be any issues there. And then finally, you know, just the administrative cost of, of implementing such a buyout. So while these are the traditional cons uh, that are listed, you know, I would say, you know, there is a little bit of potentially a silver lining here or a, a little bit of a, an arbitrage situation that if, if the current interest rates, you know, stay where they're at, which is, you know, roughly 50 basis points lower than they were, at the end of 2013, we have a chance to pay out these terminated vested participants 
here before the end of the year, and we can pay them out at that uh, at those interest rates that were in effect at the end of 2013 and get them off the books before we have to revalue them at the end of 2014 using that lower interest rate and, and looking at, again, another uh, more volatility in DB plans into the balance sheet. So I think there's real incentive here to try to uh, you know, try to mitigate that before the end of the year. Um, you know, in addition to you know saving the the premiums on on the PBGC side. Uh, so after you've taken a look at uh, you know, so you're, you're going to want to take a look at this analysis and have your actuary sit down and figure out what the savings is for you specifically. Um, uh, like everyone, you want, you're going to want to do a cost-benefit analysis, but I will speak, you know, in very broad terms. Um, you know, the cost of the, of the terminated invested buyout does vary based on the size of your plan and the level of complication of your plan design. Uh, but, you know, just the PBGC flat rate premium increases themselves. I think for most of our clients, you know, the ROI of the administrative cost of putting this program into place. It's about a two-year return on their investment when you consider, um, you know, what the PBGC flat rate premium alone is going to be over the next couple of years. So um, I, I think there's pretty strong evidence. Of course, you know, you need to look at, you know, every plan has their own specific situation, but you know, we really do expect this to be popular here over the next few months. Uh, so it's just about time for me to shut up and turn this over to Mark. Um, just a couple additional thoughts that, you know, if you do implement this, if you are, you know, implementing some kind of LDI strategy, uh, and even if you're not, you're going to want to talk with your investment advisor and, and plan ahead because, you know, you're going to be looking at uh, potentially releasing a significant portion of the liability uh, and what impact they may, that may have on your LDI strategy or just making sure there's enough cash on hand, uh, enough liquidity uh, within the pension plan to handle uh, all the payments. And at this point, then, I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Um, now that you've listened to me talk about, you know, why you should do it, uh, Mark's going to spend a few minutes talking about, you know, actually taking you through the process. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Matt said, I want to walk through a process of uh, – implementing a term vested buyout and we're going to take a hypothetical example here. So this is someone who has decided that they want to go through a buyout window and have all the distributions completed by the end of December 31, 2014. Uh, and then through this timeline we'll walk through some milestones and and some things to watch out for as you're going through your operational plan of how to uh, administered to the buyout, but uh, the, the the end date is is key because uh, generally companies want to get all the distributions out by the end of a, a corporate fiscal year, so they can take whatever accounting impact uh, in that fiscal year, and not have it bleed into the next. So uh, we always like to begin with when do you want the last payment made? In this case, like I say, it'll be December 31, 2014. Then we build backwards. So. If we look at the timeline, this hypothetical here, the buyout analysis really takes place over a period of three months. And as Matt mentioned, what we want to do is look at what is the impact on the plan itself. Uh, and Matt had mentioned a couple of those. Uh, what is the impact on the company, in, in particular, uh, any accounting charges that may be reflected? And then whatever boundaries there are. Um, some companies have set up a buyout window to avoid any type of negative accounting charge, and you need to go through some type of analysis beforehand to understand at what point may those accounting charges trigger and, and how to go about uh, avoiding them. So the buyout analysis can take a number of months, and here we're, we're going through the months of May, June, and July, and at the end of that period, it's, it's either a go or a no-go decision. Uh, and if it's a go decision, then we spend the month of August uh, finalizing the buyout. And here there might be some amendments to the plan. 
um, specific to the window, for example, uh, how is the lump sum calculated? There might be some incentives provided to take the lump sum, uh, things of that nature. Um, operations, and this is really gets to the point of, of resources that will be committed to uh, administering the buyout window. Um, and it could be internal resources or you could use an outside consulting firm with external resources uh, or a combination of the, of the two. Um, and then finally, uh, any committee approvals that need to be put into place for the, the window to happen. Now, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the operations side because uh, what really drives the direction I think most companies want to go, if it's internally um, resource or external resources, what's the volume? Um, there's been a number of buyouts uh, that have um, – you know, not publicly publish the results, but the word gets out. And the take rate, which means of all the offers that are made, how many, how many actually take the window? So, uh, and that ranges, uh, you know, right around 50%, uh, some below, some above. Um, we've seen them as high as, you know, 55 to 60%. And then that really, which is another or decision on the operations is uh, how you how well you want to market these and what we've seen is there a direct correlation to if there's a strong communication campaign announcements letter going out to the participants ahead of time announcing the program is happening um, you know a very focused marketing campaign along the buyout as to why it's happening why it's good for them and why the company is offering uh, will increase the take rate, which may be uh, advantageous. Um, then you get into the month of, of August, and this is really a lot of data, final data preparation, uh, finalizing addresses. Some, a lot of these participants, uh, the company has lost touch with them, and so you need to utilize a, a record search database to obtain updated addresses and, and then obviously finalizing the accrued benefits. Um, announcement letters will go out in September. And one of the things, and this is uh, a pitfall to, to keep an eye on is, uh, and I make mention of it with spouse data, uh, for a lot of these plans to take a lump sum, uh, there will be required spousal consent if the participant is married, and to get that, you need information on, for example, spouse date of birth and if, birth and if they are married. Uh, the announcement letter can be used as a vehicle to try to get that information ahead of time. So we've seen situations where the announcement letter goes up, out with a request that if they're married to either call a number and provide the spouse information or return a card with, with spouse information. That can really help help down the road uh, as you're going through the window and, and trying to collect that data if it doesn't, if it's not provided. So then in October, we're going to open up the window. Um, in, the, in this case, the window is open for two months, all of October and November. Now, what to expect once the window opens? Um, we've got some metrics that we use. Uh, one of which is 120% of those eligible under the bio program will call. <laughs> now, what that means, for example, if there's a thousand terminated vested participants uh, that will be sent a notice of a bio offering, that 1,200 there'll be 1,200 phone calls coming in, which of course means that people call multiple times. Um, those calls come in spikes. The first two weeks, there's a big spike. Uh, we've got a reminder letter in November. That's another big spike. In the last two weeks, there's another big spike. So, uh, again, back to the operations of it, um, you know, that's a rule of thumb to try to anticipate the call volume to make sure there's resources on staff or external resources if that's the decision to handle those. Um, another point to keep in mind is as packages are completed by the participant and returned that we've seen that one out of every two are returned incorrectly. So for example, if it requires spouse 
uh, notary signature uh, from the spouse wa spousal waiver, um, the signatures aren't there. Or it's not notarized or something of that nature. And that, again, will require effort to reach back out to the participant to, cor to collect that missing piece of information before the window closes. Um, so the window will go on. In this case, it'll end uh, about December 1st because the trustee now needs to take all the information, collect all the, or receive all the data uh, for the payouts and get it into their system to make sure all those distributions are, um, are made by the end of December 31st. Uh, what we generally do is well up in front of uh, or when we set the uh, the timeline for a buyout, we we communicate with the trustee directly, make sure they're aware of what's happening, uh, the potential size of distributions that could come as a result of this effort, and work with them on what uh, you know how they want to receive that information and timing on their part to make sure there's no uh, delays. Um, at the end of the window period, December 31st. Uh, you know, the, basically the window is shut down, um, and then we have some post-distribution. We usually keep our call center open for another month just in case there's any follow-up questions that, that may happen. Um, one point I want to come back to on December 1, what about procrastinators? Uh, there's always situations where someone will miss the window and come back and ask to, um, you know, for forgiveness. Um, and you've got to take a pretty hard stance on that or make a decision up front, what do you want to do? Do you want to keep the window open for them or, or you know, just take a hard stance on it? I, I, in my opinion, one of the best approaches I've seen is back when the amendment is written. The memo was written in a way that the window would only be, um, you know, the distribution would only be completed if the package was uh, completed in good order uh, in this case, by December 1st. Uh, so that that way, the plan sponsor is not faced with any type of decisions on should they extend the period for the, these individuals or not. Uh, but those are some decisions that I think, as you go through, you want to want to think through uh, and have um, a process in place to make those 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 judgments. Uh, and that's it for the timeline. So, Mac, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, we've quite, covered quite a bit in a very short amount of time, uh, but we are uh, at our full 30 minutes. Uh, feel free to call or email either uh, Mark or myself to talk in greater detail about any specific questions you might have. Uh, an audio recording of this meeting will be posted on our website in the next few days, and a link to the recording will be included in a follow-up email that you will shortly receive. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope we have achieved our goal of educating you about de-risking considerations as well as the terminated vested buyout process. Thank you for your time.